Hashima, what have you done? You try to control the power of the sun. And when the earth shook, it started a war. Death floats in the air and it washes ashore. The missile will come in, or the bombs, at 20 times the speed of sound. You won't even hear them. They'll explode here with six times the heat inside the center of the sun. And this is ground zero. It will dig a hole three quarters of a mile wide and 800 feet deep, turning us, the buildings, and the earth below to radioactive fallout shut up in the mushroom cloud. Five miles in all directions, everyone's vaporized. 20 miles from here in all directions, everyone will be lethally burnt, lying in what remains of the buildings and what remains of the streets. People will be sucked out of buildings by winds at 500 miles an hour, turning into missiles traveling at 100 miles an hour. Windows popcorn, shards of glass decapitating people. And then the whole area will be engulfed in a huge firestorm of 3,000 square miles. Even in winter in Boston, everything will burn. And as these fires burn, huge amounts of black radioactive smoke are shot up into the stratosphere all over the country, and the fires will coalesce right across America, east to west, north to south, and the whole country will burn. And as these cities burn all over the world, there'll be millions of corpses. But you can imagine what devastation it would be. We are close to that. We are like lemmings walking blindly towards a cliff of nuclear annihilation, worrying about things that don't matter. That doomsday clock they talk about was not designed in heaven. The time was set at seven minutes to midnight and 47. Many near catastrophes have come along the way. Now climate change is ticking several seconds off each day. Scientists agree, and they keep trying to warn us The politicians hide the truth and try the best to scorn us The masses are too busy with reality TV Reality is fiction in a twist of irony Science has been taken over by corporate greed and power The oil companies rule today, making millions every hour the corporations are now people bound to eat their young Don't you dare protest or they'll rip out your tongue Here we are the moment near 30 seconds to the hour The time has come or has it passed for those who are in power Have we sealed our fate by choosing to ignore this doomsday clock whose consequence is worse than a third world war. Three issues threaten life on Earth at the moment. Um, nuclear war, which is really very serious, more serious than the height of the Cold War. Global warming, which seems to have reached a tipping point and nuclear power, not that it will end life on Earth, but it will change all species and human beings through genetic modification um, and sort of random compulsory genetic engineering from the radioactive waste. Since its inception in 1947, the Doomsday Clock, announced by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, moved the hands of the clock to three minutes to midnight representing the countdown to a nuclear apocalypse, midnight. Disasters like Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, Fukushima, and others spew radiation into our oceans and skies and represent another imminent existential threat to life on the planet. Nuclear war and nuclear power, together with climate change, the third existential threat to life on the planet, are moving the hands of the clock closer and closer to midnight. 
This film traces the trajectory of American militarism and exceptionalism from the arrival of the white Europeans in the 15th century to the present day. America's destiny has brought humanity to the very brink of extinction. From the beginning of the discovery of the Americas in the 15th century, the European explorers and settlers looked down on the Native Americans as uncivilized savages. Over the next 300 years, millions of Native Americans in what is now the United States were massacred. Many of those that survived later died of disease, starvation, and suicide. The rest were herded onto reservations where today many live in squalor. And as if adding insult to injury, the U.S. has broken, nullified, or amended over 500 treaties with Native American tribes, the most recent being with the Dakota Sioux in North Dakota. This genocide has been conveniently eradicated from the consciousness of the majority of the American people. But the fact is, violence and killing have been part of the American narrative from the very beginning. These first settlers in America believed that God had blessed them with their discovery and the right to claim the land as their own. As the young nation grew, it was necessary to expand all the way to the west coast to establish settlements and impose political rule. They believed this was their destiny, their obvious fate, and given to them by God, and therefore morally justified. This doctrine was eventually applied to the whole world. Today, America remains the only military superpower in the world, and every American president since 1901 has used the military and the CIA to impose America's will on every continent by political assassinations, overthrowing sovereign governments, and the bombing and murdering of innocent people seeking self-determination and freedom from imperial domination. The American public has been duped into believing that this use of power and might is a good thing because it keeps us safe and spreads democracy and freedom throughout the world. Since 1798, the United States has intervened militarily more than 500 times to protect her capitalist interests. The threats and intimidation continue today against China, North Korea, Syria, and Russia, with massive war games right on Russia's borders. These interventions prove that American foreign policy has not been motivated by the moral imperative to spread freedom and democracy, but by the following three imperatives. Globalization, feeding the military industrial complex and the banks who have all bribed the presidents in the White House and the Congress. And preventing the rise of any society that might serve as a successful example of an alternative to capitalism, communism, socialism, or any system not in line with American interests. 
expanding political, economic, and military hegemony over the entire globe to guarantee number one and two, and to prevent the rise of any regional power that might challenge American supremacy. So we have, at this point, around 800 bases in some 80 countries around the world. Uh, in fact, at the end of the Cold War, there were, uh, there were more bases, around 1,600. Um, so the number has divided in about half. Um, but the breadth of this collection of bases has actually doubled. There were uh, 1,600 bases in about 40 countries at the end of the Cold War. And today, there are around 800 bases in around 80 countries. Um, so growing number of countries are occupied, in fact, by US bases. For example, there are almost 200 bases still in Germany, more than two decades after the end of the Cold War. There are more than 120 bases in Japan, nearly 100 in South Korea, 50 in Italy, and tens of bases in countries like Britain, Turkey, uh, and countries from Asia to Europe, Central America, and beyond. One of the justifications for this huge collection of bases for decades has been that US bases overseas spread democracy. And while this might have had some validity in the early days of the post-World War II era in Germany, Italy, Japan, uh, today we find US bases in more than 30 countries that are led by undemocratic, often dictatorial regimes. So we have our bases de facto supporting and helping to prop up, in some cases, undemocratic regimes and helping to block the progress of pro-democracy movements. Despite the end of the Cold War, the United States has continued to maintain hundreds of bases in, in East Asia surrounding China, um, as well as hundreds of bases still in, in Western and increasingly in Central and Eastern Europe surrounding Russia. And in my mind, these are incredibly dangerous moves, especially the efforts to increase the number of bases, both surrounding China and increasingly close to Russian borders in, in Central and, and Eastern Europe. I think US citizens should think for a moment how we would feel if Russia or China were to build even a single base any, anywhere near US borders, in the Caribbean, for example, or in, in Mexico. I think there would very quickly be a, a hue and cry to uh, respond militarily, to build up our military defenses and military forces and military spending. So why we would expect anything different from Russia and China, I, I think, is, is perplexing. Um, it seems to me a, a very dangerous and potentially self-fulfilling strategy where uh, the rise of Chinese military power, for example, is the, given as the justification for building up US military forces in East Asia. Uh, this is only encouraging China to further build up its military power and its military forces and what can be and is looking to be an escalating spiral of, of militarism. Uh, I think what is behind all this, of course, is a struggle for geopolitical, geoeconomic control. Uh, China and Russia have been rising powers in the last decade, decade and a half, two decades, and the United States is sought in various ways, although primarily in military ways, to maintain its global dominance. And the construction and maintenance of US military bases near Chinese and Russian borders has been a major uh, facet of this strategy to try to maintain US global dominance. The Spanish-American War of 1898 ended Spain's colonial empire in the Western Hemisphere and secured the position of the United States as a Pacific power. The American victory in the war compelled the Spanish to relinquish claims on Cuba and to cede sovereignty over Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines to the United States. The United States also illegally possessed the independent Kingdom of Hawaii in 1898. The war enabled the United States to establish its dominance in the Caribbean and to pursue its strategic, economic, and military interest in the Asia-Pacific. Um, sea power was essential for all the, the great empires of the past, right? The ability to command the seas uh, was, was crucial to being a, this powerful nation, and that the United States needed to make that leap from a continental power, a land-based power, into a maritime power. And this is where Hawaii comes into the picture. So looking across the ocean, you know, I think China at that time was the prize. Today, China is also an obsession, but it's seen as a rival. 
uh, but at that time China was was seen as a source of, of uh, markets, a source of labor, a source of uh, materials, uh, and the European powers were already carving out pieces of China for their own uh, benefit. And the United States wanted in on the action, except there was this uh, large ocean uh, between uh, North America and Asia. And so um, being a maritime power required having the facilities, the logistical infrastructure in order to support uh, that type of, uh, of a naval presence. And this is where uh, Mahan noticed it. Uh, in 1873, uh, John Schofield and Burton Alex Colonel Burton Alexander uh, did a secret uh, sort of military survey of the Hawaiian Islands. And they reported back that Kiavalao o Pu'uloa, or what people today know as Pearl Harbor, uh, was the key to the Central Pacific Ocean. So this is where the, you know, the thinking really begins to accelerate about what is the strategic value of, the, of Hawaii to the United States in its sort of future ambitions as a great oceanic power. Uh, and they start looking at how they're going to make uh, Pu'uloa into uh, a naval station, a coaling station, uh, in order to, uh, for its ships to reach across the Pacific. On August 12, 1898, during annexation ceremonies at Iolani Palace, two figures stood on a platform before an international gathering. Sanford B. Dole and U.S. Minister Harold Sewell exchanged treaty ratifications annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States. Or so it appeared. But was it really a treaty of annexation? And did Hawaii really become a territory of the United States? Hawaii plays that kind of pivotal role, and yet it's often um, somewhat concealed by the fact that we're considered America, right? And, and that, that sort of hides the colonial and imperial history of, of the island. On the environmental impacts um, of the military in Hawaii, um, well, first of all, we just have to consider the, the extent. Like, what does this military presence look like? I think it's, it's, it's often shocking to people to realize that the military has um, according to their uh, reports, 118 sites in the Hawaiian Islands. Everything from the very large bases like Pearl Harbor and the Kanohe Marine Base and Fort um, uh, uh, Schofield Barracks, all the way to very small outposts, right? But um, it encompasses over 230,000 acres of land. Um, and here on the island of Oahu, which is the most densely populated and also the most densely militarized, 24.6% uh, of our land is uh, under military control. So we have everything from the damage to ecosystems to um, unexploded ordnance that are in hundreds of locations throughout the islands. Another uh, environmental impact are the kinds of toxins that um, are less visible to the eye and less, less obvious. Um, the, the invisible toxins like the, the chemicals that seep into uh, the soil and the groundwater. And so, um, for example, uh, in Aiea, there's an area where um, perchloroethylene and diesel fuel have spilled into the ground and are on the groundwater moving. Um, and they found perchloroethylene uh, seeping out into the harbor. Um, they don't have any means of con containing it or removing it, and so they're just uh, watching it. <laughs> they're doing monitored natural attenuation, is what they call it, with basically doing nothing. Um, another example is in Red Hill, um, near uh, in the Halava um, uh, Ahupua of the island of Oahu, um, there are once secret um, fuel tanks buried in the mountainside, uh, the Red Hill complex. Twenty uh, enormous tanks. They're 200 in, uh, feet tall, uh, 100 feet in diameter. They hold uh, a, a couple of million gallons each. Um, 19 of the 20 tanks have leaked over the years and most recently in January of 2015 they discovered that um, approximately 27,000 gallons of jet fuel have uh, leaked out and they don't know exactly where it's going. Now this wouldn't, this um, would, is even more concerning to us because of its proximity to uh, an aquifer. Maybe 5,000 feet away um, is where uh, the Board of Water Supply has one of their most important wells where they supply fresh drinking water to the people of Honolulu. And so um, these are just some of the examples of these um, environmental impacts that continue to uh, threaten our environment, threaten the community. 
the, the main base on the island of Hawaii is called the Pohakuloa Training Area, PTA, Pohakuloa, uh, which, interesting, it means the, the heavenly realm. It's the unity between the two mountains, sacred mountains of Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. It's called the saddle area, the unity area between the male and female in Hawaiian culture. And this area, Pohakuloa, the heavenly realm, has been used now for 60 years as a bombing range for both the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, even foreign troops. They have a thing called RIMPAC, Rim of the Pacific Military Exercises, of uh, uh, dozens of countries every two years that come here to bomb. And every kind of weapon imaginable has been fired there. In addition to Pohokuloa, we were able to document uh, 56 other present or former military sites on this island. Uh, to put it in perspective, it's over 250,000 acres of military hazardous areas on this island. Many of them bombing ranges from World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, that have never been cleaned up. Pohakuloa alone, over 14 million live rounds a year are fired at Pohakuloa. And what we discovered in 2007, radiation weapons were used there as well. We're sitting here today uh, right next to the Pohakuloa training area. It's a several thousand acre uh, military training area uh, under lease and executive order takings of uh, Hawaiian Kingdom land. And uh, back in the 1960s, the uh, Army had conducted training with the Davy Crockett uh, nuclear bombs. It's a mini nuclear bomb and they used spotting rounds that contained depleted uranium here in Hawaii and because of poor record keeping the army has no idea how many of those uh, spotting rounds they spent here in Pohakaloa or even the exact location so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, found the uh, army guilty of possession without a license but they waived all penalties so it was basically uh, just whitewash nothing really happened I think what we, as an organization, or as people of the Pacific, are trying to accomplish is our understanding of not only, not only what we need to stop, but also how we need to think about our humanity as a people, yeah? Do you would you like to see all of the American bases go from all the islands? I think that America needs to come to terms with why it builds those bases, why it goes beyond its own borders, or even why within the borders that they live in, why, why they do what they do. So would you like to see all the bases go, Americans go home? Is that part of what the indigenous people, the island people would like to see and, and get their land back. Of course, but that's not really going to happen unless people understand why it's wrong. I think that is a big um, challenge to Americans. Why do they do it? Who does it? For what reason? So that they don't keep on using one generation to the next to perpetuate this ideology that it's okay to go and um, destroy places in the world um, for under the banner of national security. Why does that mentality even exist that you think that you have the right to take over a whole island in the Pacific to use it for military training for national security? You know, that, that, that kind of thinking needs to be dealt with, it needs to be confronted, and it needs to be talked about. I don't know what we can do here, but uh, we need help from the rest of the world to stop the badness as far as militarization of not only how Hawaii, but our entire planet. Uh, corporations that manufacture uh, weapons of mass destruction are leading the charge forward in uh, I guess instigating wars uh, around the world because uh, they, they're in it for the money. 
Well, living here in Hawaii and then going to places in, the, in Asia and other places in the Pacific has been primarily uh, to document the U.S. militarization of the region, and particularly with the Obama administration and its pivot to Asia and the Pacific, a pivot that's uh, caused, uh, I think, because the Middle East is in such turmoil from what the Bush administration has done that the pivot to Asia and the Pacific is to go to fresh meat, really, is to go to a place where the U.S. has not been stirring the pot all that much. Although when you look at the long-term bases that we've had in Asia and the Pacific uh, for the last 70 years, since the end of World War II, the United States has had extensive military bases in Korea, in Japan, on Guam, uh, in Singapore, uh, and of course here in Hawaii where this island of Oahu is one of the most militarized places on earth with four major military bases on this one island. So being, being uh, on trips into Asia and the Pacific to see the extensive extensive network that the United States has and the provocative actions that U.S. military forces are taking in South Korea where the annual exercises, the military war games continually uh, elicit, purposefully elicit strong responses from the North Korean government which the South Korean government and the U.S. government can use to say, see, see, look at those North Koreans. They you can't trust them, they're always so belligerent. But when you look at really what's happened, it's usually based, uh, North Korean comments and actions are based on, on incidents that the U.S. and South Korea have triggered. So watching what's going on with North Korea, watching with China, here you have China, which is the supplier to the United States of a huge portion of the goods and materials that we need now because we have ceded to China and to other countries the industrial base that used to be the United States. Uh, we have ceded it to them for the lower wages and then the lower price of goods as they send them back to us. And yet now we are taking on and, and purposefully uh, poking at the eye of the, uh, uh, of the Chinese uh, in ways that in my opinion, as a former diplomat and a retired military officer, are done purposefully to, uh, to, to scare the American people so that our Congress can continue to allocate huge amounts of money for the U.S. military budget. I returned to the Pacific in August of 2015 to document the presence and effects of the massive U.S. military presence from Hawaii all the way down to the Marshall Islands. The first stop was Kyoto, Japan, where the U.S. has a radar station in the remote and pristine northern Kyoto prefecture. We met with the locals there who have been protesting against this base and the desecration of their land for many years. From Kyoto, I traveled to Okinawa to document the effects of the United States militarism on the people, the culture, the politics, and the environment. The people there had been staging a long, peaceful, nonviolent protest against the construction of a new U.S. naval base in Hinoko and a U.S. military presence on this once sovereign nation so large that the entire island is often referred to as one large American base. I knew next to nothing about the war in the Pacific except for the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the iconic raising of the flag on Iwo Jima, and the newsreels in the movie theaters glorifying the naval battles in the South Pacific that demonized the Japanese. The bloodiest battle of the war on Okinawa led to the subsequent colonization and occupation of Okinawa and Japan from 1945 to the very present day. They call it kamikaze, meaning the divine tempest. We call them suicide planes. The fleet that came to stay paid a price too. But our men, our ships, our planes, took everything the land could throw at the sea and handed it back double. The question, 
could a fleet stand up against the massed fury of land-based planes, got an emphatic answer from the men who fight to live, from the fleet that came to stay. As soon as the fighting ended, the Americans came with bayonets and bulldozers to begin the construction of many more bases. Those Okinawans who survived the most brutal battle of the war in the Pacific were forced to leave their land at gunpoint and herded into internment camps where they lived in squalor. What began 70 years ago was an occupation that continues today. How can it be described any other way? The Americans came to stay, constructing more than 40 bases in Japan and Okinawa, with 74% of them located on this tiny island. This is the massive, sprawling Camp Schwab, as seen from the beautiful and pristine Ora Bay in Hinoko. It is the intended relocation of the Futenma Marine Air Base, which is located in the densely populated area of Ginawan City. The proposed new base will have dual runways stretching out into Ora Bay. Whenever the weather permits, teams of activists set out into Ora Bay in kayaks and boats to obstruct progress on the base. Floating barriers are set up around the proposed construction area to keep activists out. What takes place is a cat and mouse game between activists and the Japanese Coast Guard and police who patrol the area in yachts and rubber boats. My name is Mayuko Kato and 27 years old and I came from Kanagawa Prefecture, Japan. Why do you come here? Mm -hmm. Why? Because I first saw the movie about here. It's made 2005 and one old woman said please kill me if you broke our sea and I had a very shock and I don't want to injure the old woman anymore and I think we have to protect the old woman, old man in Okinawa so I came here but then I came here I don't think it's not only Okinawa pr problem Whose problem is it? I think it's all over the world, like Kanjon, um, that's not only Kanjon problem, also Henoko is not only Henoko problem, Japanese government did that, I think it's America and, the, and other world, whole world made, made Japan government like that. They made J Japanese government do this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I quit my job. Um, you quit your job? Yeah, yeah. To come here? Yeah, to came here. How long have you been here now? Uh, six months. Six months? Yeah. How long will you stay? Uh, until this year. One year? Yeah. The American people never hear by the, the people, boys, who grab the land. Also a rape girl. So Many people must have to hear the voice of the mm, victims. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it make you angry to think about it all? Yeah, make very sad. My next stop was Hiroshima for the 70th anniversary of the atomic bombing on August 6th. Tens of thousands of men and women and children including survivors of that horrific crime, attended the ceremony and placed flowers and wreaths at the memorial. Never again was the sentiment expressed by all. The dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki ushered in a new era in human history. Since the testing of the first atomic bomb in New Mexico, nuclear arms have proliferated. Today, nine countries, including Israel and North Korea, have stockpiles totaling 15,375 nuclear weapons. By now, I had become aware of the lies and myths we had been taught about World War II 
and the war with Japan. So in 2016, when John Kerry and Barack Obama visited Hiroshima, placed wreaths at the memorial, but did not apologize for the bombings, it confirmed another display of American hypocrisy and arrogance. The President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, the Chiefs of Staff had to make the plan for the invasion of Japan without considering the atomic bomb. It was estimated that to land on Kyushu and conquer it would cost 250,000 of our youngsters in be, uh, to be killed and 500,000 of them to be maimed for life. have spent more than two billion dollars on the greatest scientific gamble in history and we have won. At Potsdam, Truman got word of how incredibly powerful the bomb test at Almogordo was, the Trinity test, and he writes in his journal that night, he says, that we've discovered the most terrible weapon in history. This may be the fire destruction prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. Truman understood this was not just a bigger bomb, a more powerful bomb. He said this is the fire, potentially the fire destruction. This could end all life on the planet. Returning to Kangjong Village on Jeju Island, South Korea, where I filmed the peaceful, nonviolent 24-7 protest against the construction of a massive naval base to accommodate America's pivot, I found the base completed. Not surprisingly, the daily struggle of the villagers continued. Activists in kayaks protested the arrival of the first warship to enter the base, an Aegis destroyer. It was actually on my first trip to Jeju Island in South Korea in 2012 that opened my eyes to the fast escalating provocations of China and North Korea in the region. Why are you still here and why are the Jesuits building a house here? We want to be witness. Witness who is uh, uh, opposing this naval base. From our faith, eh, we cannot escape. We cannot escape from the evil. Evil is always here, and then we must say something against the evil. I then travel further down the Pacific to the Marshall Islands, where from 1946 to 1958, the United States detonated 67 nuclear bombs each of which was more than a thousand times more powerful than the one that was dropped on Hiroshima. It was here that I learned of the devastating effects of these tests on the people, the culture, and this exotic island paradise. From 1946 to 1958, the U.S. government tested 67 nuclear weapons at Bikini and Eniwetok atolls in the Marshall Islands. In order to do that, it displaced two populations, the people who were living on Bikini and Eniwetok, to other atolls and islands so that the tests could go ahead. The, at the time of the initial Bikini tests, the U.S. Naval commander uh, told the Bikinians that the U.S. government was testing the bombs for the good of mankind. Uh, and to end all world wars. And the Bikinians faced with seeing a large segment of the U.S. Navy in its lagoon already uh, had little choice but to move off the island. Well, in 1954, the United States tested its largest hydrogen bomb known as Bravo at Bikini Atoll. And before that test was exploded, uh, not only was the danger zone redrawn to make it smaller, uh, but people who had been in what was previously considered to be possibly a hazard zone uh, were not evacuated. Scientists monitoring the test quickly realized that something was wrong. The lithium-7 hadn't been inert. The explosion wasn't 6 megatons, but 15, 
250% of the expected size. Because of the miscalculation, the fallout from Castle Bravo test was far more than anticipated. The firing team was trapped in their bunker by high radiation. Two populated atolls to the east were belatedly evacuated. Not expecting to have to move people, they was forced to press destroyers, originally sent for security reasons, in the service. The islanders suffered many health problems for decades, including birth defects. Uh, some of them very serious exposure to the point where uh, people had skin burns, uh, suffered vomiting and diarrhea, later on hair loss, all classic, uh, classic symptoms of severe radiation poisoning. Uh, so this was in 1954. The tests continued until 1958, a total of 67. Uh, some people like to say that this compares to about one and a half Hiroshima bombs going off every day in the Marshall Islands for 12 years. But of course, their people's exposure was much higher because not only did they get the external exposure of just fallout landing on their skin, but you have to appreciate that Marshall Islanders in the 1950s uh, lived on almost a 100% subsistence diet, meaning they ate from the land and the lagoon. So fallout uh, covered the trees, was in all of the, all of the food products, and was multiplied in things like coconut crabs, which ate coconuts, uh, which were filled with cesium-137 as a result of the roots of these trees sucking up the radioactivity and then it appearing in the coconuts and then the coconut crabs eat the coconuts and the people eat the coconut crabs. They used a crater from one of the nuclear weapons tests on an island called Runit and dumped all this radioactive debris into this crater left from the nuclear bomb or nuclear test Dumped, in, dumped all this stuff in the crater and then capped it with concrete. So it's created what is now known as the Runit Dome. And the Runit Dome has radioactive material that contains plutonium, cesium, and probably every radioactive element known to the nuclear weapons program uh, inside. Uh, now, that's essentially a nuclear waste repository uh, being that it's on an atoll, and an atoll being a very porous construction, uh, when there's high tide and low tide, the water table goes up and down according to the tides. Uh, the, 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 uh, the bottom of the crater was not lined, so there's, you know, there's obviously leaching that goes on down into the environment uh, from Runit. My name is Kenneth Carey. I am the uh, Senator for the People of Rongalab and the Nidijala of the Marshall Islands, the Parliament, National Parliament of the Marshall Islands, uh, and I represent the people of Rongalab. Marshall Island is a material society. We, 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 we have our inherent right through our mothers, and a lot of these rights are based on our land. The very fabric, uh, uh, fabric of our culture and society is all linked to the land. You know, and when, when the land is taken away from you, and like in our case, we're not living on Rongalab Atoll because it's contaminated. You are basically, you have basically taken everything away from us. It, it, it's so different from the way you value land in the United States. You just buy and sell. And you just evaluate according to the location of the land. It's different. Here, it's your livelihood. Everything about your life, where you, where you are born, where you will be raised, where you will be buried, it's all in the land. And it's your rights, inherent right from you know the creator, uh, and and when it's taken away from you, it's basically the whole life of being a human being as a Marshallese is taken away from you, psychologically, socially, and everything else, economically, it's taken away from you. One of our biggest problem in terms of addressing the radiation legacy in the Marshall Islands is that the public do not know, American public do are not aware. It was not made part of their history. If you look at it, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bomb were 7,000 times less than the Marshall Islands, yet everyone knows about the bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but not the Marshall Islands. This was well-kept secret, and I think that's one of our big obstacles in getting the compensation that we deserve and getting our health and our land restored back to us. 
But the Marshallese are not the only ones suffering from the effects of radiation from the test, but are among the first to witness the devastating effects of climate change. Already thousands have immigrated to Hawaii and the United States mainland in advance of their cultural homes sinking into the ocean. In my travels through the Pacific, and recently to Ukraine and Russia, I found that no one wanted war, and most wanted the U.S. to leave. It became very clear to me that regardless of skin color, religion, and cultural practices, we are all one family, and all desirous of peace and the elimination of war. The TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is an instrument of the Pacific pivot. And Ash Carter, the Secretary of Defense, said that I need the TPP because it's more important for me than a new aircraft carrier group. The TPP is a declaration of economic warfare and not just of corporations against people. It's a concerted plan to undermine Chinese economic growth which has been clearly on an ascendant track doing a huge share of pulling along the world economy. Now, China, in case you haven't noticed, is actually in the Asia Pacific, but it's unambiguously excluded from the TPP. The TPP is a multinational economic aircraft carrier, or if you will, a slave galleon that is set up to do battle against China, a kind of a neoliberal battering ram with all the stops pulled out. Functioning as the economic arm of the Pacific pivot, the TPP creates a powerful economic bloc, press-ganging Pacific Rim economies to ally against China en masse to force an economic blockade, takedown, submission, if necessary. In May of 2012, I traveled to Odessa, Ukraine, with Bruce Gagnon and an international coalition of activists and journalists who were there to monitor the second anniversary memorial service of the May 2, 2014 massacre. This is the Trades Union Hall in Odessa, Ukraine. And this area around it is what's called Kolokovo Field. Three days ago, when we came here for the May 2nd memorial service organized by the Mothers Committee, the Council of Mothers. This whole area was blocked off to the public. We weren't a lot, not allowed to be here. What happened two years ago is that just after the coup d'etat in Kiev that was organized by the United States, Victoria Nuland, under, uh, Assistant Secretary of State, working for Hillary Clinton at the time, she bragged that the U.S. spent $5 billion on this project of the coup d'etat in Ukraine that threw out an elected government. Since Ukraine's independence in 1991, the United States has supported Ukrainians as they build democratic skills and institutions, as they promote civic participation and good governance, all of which are preconditions for Ukraine to achieve its European aspirations. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. I can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it. And, you know. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because you can be pretty sure that if it, does, if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. Fuck the EU. And so here on May 2nd, 2014, the people gathered what we call tabling in our country. They gathered with booths out here collecting signatures because a lot of the public is walking through this beautiful park. And they were attacked by several thousand neo-Nazis who were bussed in and many believe paid for by the U.S., by the CIA, by the National Endowment for Democracy. But anyway, they attacked the spot and set it afire. And so the people that were 
running this tabling operation ran inside the building to protect themselves, closed the doors, and then those same neo-Nazis then took Molotov cocktails and began throwing them through the windows and at the doors, and soon the building was on fire. The people inside were uh, consumed by the smoke and they came to the windows to try to get some air. And there are videos now all over YouTube uh, showing people on the ground, these neo-Nazis with guns shooting at the people in the windows. And it wasn't long that people were actually jumping out of windows because the fire was coming close, the smoke was killing them. And when they hit the ground, these neo-Nazis took bats and we're beating them to death. So the bottom line then is to move NATO into this region. In fact, right at this very moment, Obama just having been in Germany in recent days, calling on uh, Germany and other countries to help the United States deploy 20,000 more troops into Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, in addition to those that are already uh, been deployed there. And when Russia has uh, military exercises inside of their own country in response, they're accused by the United States and NATO of being provocative. Well, what's more provocative than these U.S. and NATO deployments right on the Russian border? What if you reverse the whole situation and it was Russia or China putting bases in Canada or Mexico? The United States would go ballistic. The Cuban Missile Crisis all over again. But when we do it here in this part of the world, it's no big deal. And in fact, the American people don't even know it's happening. That in an interview at about this time, uh, Putin also said, look, one of the main reasons, actually just as important, if not more important, as preventing Ukraine from getting into NATO was our fear of the anti-ballistic missile system that the US and NATO wants to set up around our periphery. We didn't want uh, Crimea to be a site of part of that anti-ballistic missile system, which we believe is not defensive in nature, but actually uh, preparatory to a possible first strike to prevent our retaliatory capabilities. So when we say the United States is the sole indispensable country in the world, what do we say about the other countries? That they're dispensable? Yeah, that's right, that they're dispensable. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> now that's the attitude. And that's the attitude that people like Putin observe and have to take into account when they're looking after their own national interests. So Mr. Putin has shown himself, in my view, as a very restrained, a very restrained statesman with sang froid that won't quit. I've seen him under severe provocation, i.e. mounting a coup on his doorstep. The so-called neoconservatives, and I would number Hillary Clinton in their number, have shown themselves to be incredibly irresponsible. Mounting a coup on Russia's uh, doorstep after it had been advertised two weeks before in YouTube, and then threatening to arm the rebels in Ukraine, uh, mounting all kinds of NATO exercises right up against the, the frontier of what used to be the Soviet Union and now is Russia. These are extremely provocative acts. As we have seen, the threat of a nuclear Armageddon has humanity on the brink of extinction because of American aggression and provocations against Russia and China, two nuclear armed nations. Nuclear war. Yes, we can, if, if America took the lead to abolish its nuclear weapons, and I know Putin wants to do it, and if they do it together, they own these two countries, 93% of the nuclear weapons in the world, hydrogen bombs. These are the real terrorists, Russia and America, holding the world 
in nuclear ransom. And tonight, it could happen by accident, by computer error, by someone hacking into the early warning system of the Pentagon, or by increasing international tension, which we're seeing now, by America provoking Russia. How dare they? When Russia lost 27 million people in the Second World War, that's where the Second World War was won. And did they suffer? And how dare America now go up to the Russian borders and orchestrate a coup in the Ukraine and put in a man at Poroshenko who's a wicked crook working with Nazis in the Ukraine? How dare America accuse Russia of setting up a referendum in the, in the, in the Crimea where 97% of people voted to stay with Russia? Belong to Catherine the Great. You know, it's been there forever. In October 2016, I visited Russia because I wanted to discover for myself what Russia was like, what the Russian people were like, and what they thought about President Putin and various issues. What I learned was the exact opposite of American propaganda and lies for the past 70 years since World War II. For one, I felt safer in Russia than I do in New York City. There are no military personnel patrolling with AK-47s. The local police do not even carry weapons. Single women, old people, and youngsters are out until midnight going about their business with no fear of being attacked or molested. I was completely free to speak with whomever I wished and to travel anywhere without being followed or handled by government agents. I was surprised to learn that the Russian Constitution guarantees freedom of speech, the right to protest, and the right to organize. No one I met was afraid to express their opinions about Russia, communism, the Soviet era, or even President Putin. Russians held varying opinions of President Putin, but all credited him with restoring pride in the motherland and making Russia, again, a leader in the free world. I, namely, uh, do not support Putin uh, uh, totally, uh, but uh, I admit that his uh, foreign uh, politic is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, clever. Uh, I can't talk for all the people of the Crimea, but um, I love Mr. Putin. I mean, not love, but I do respect him. He is an exceptional person. He is uh, very intelligent. He is an extremely hard-working person. We look objectively, we can say that when he became the president of Russian Federation back in the year 2000, Russia was the country no one actually thought of seriously in the whole world, with only one superpower present at that time, and that being the United States of America. And no matter how we look at the situation, we can say that Mr. Putin has changed that. At least the world now seems close to being bipolar than it has ever been since the time of the Cold War. And this is due to Mr. President Putin. He has managed to awaken this feeling of national pride and patriotism in people. Uh, but I like Putin. I think that uh, Putin, uh, in fact, um, did a lot, contributed a lot into gathering Russia, uh, gathering Russia together, uh, because from Yeltsin, who is quite popular in the West, uh, Russia was very weak and, um, uh, let's say, uh, not very respectful, I would say like this. Uh, now, I think due to uh, uh, Putin, uh, Russia is becoming stronger and you can see this. What is your opinion of President Putin? Uh, it's mixed and contradictory. He sends uh, mm, me messages that I cannot understand. Uh, he's trying to go in two opposite directions at the same time. Uh, his uh, external uh, foreign policy contradicts his internal economic policy. And that's what puzzles me and uh, many people who I know. Well, uh, when he does right things, uh, like uh, uh, returning Crimea where it belongs historically, everybody supports him. 
His rating uh, skyrockets at this time. But when he joins the WTO uh, mm, or appoints uh, certain people in the government uh, that uh, carry out uh, wrong economic policy, then, of course, it undermines his rating. I think that Putin now is uh, pretty good uh, president for uh, uh, Russian Federation and many people support him. Uh, therefore, I think that uh, if people support uh, President Putin, maybe he's a really good president. And everyone, to a person, acknowledged that the return of Crimea to Russia represented the will of the people and that President Putin did not annex or invade Crimea. Me and Sevastopol, we began to worry and to be very anxious. You know, what would be the end uh, of this coup? So we didn't want uh, any war. Uh, we didn't want, um, you know, radical people to come to the Crimea and uh, to teach us uh, their way of life. Uh, so we just decided that it would be better for us and it would be fair uh, to come back to Russia. So your mayor started organizing this referendum. Yes. It was not Moscow. No, it was, it was not it. Moscow. Simferopol and Sevastopol, two cities. The day of referendum, there were so many people in our main square. There were a lot of uh, television screens, you know, in the square, and people could see uh, how early it was. Early in the morning. Early, from early morning till 10 evening. Uh, at 10 evening we learned the result of refer referendum, and it was shocking, you know, in a good way, shocking. More than 97% uh, people said yes to Russia. After referendum, uh, the new government of the Crimean Republic uh, uh, applied, uh, you know, to be in Russia officially. They asked uh, President, step step President uh, of Pu uh, Pu President Putin, you know, to accept the result of referendum. And Putin says yes. Uh, so, and we were so happy. It was a big holiday. And it was, I think, the next day after referendum. So American people can understand, President Putin, Russian military did not interfere with no. this referendum. No, no, everything began with uh, people, you know. Is life better? Oh, for us, yes. Life is much better because... Look, sun is shining. <laughs> because... The sky is blue and we uh, don't have bomb for our head. We love uh, Russia, we are in Russia now. Uh, we love our new president, uh, Putin is new president for us, you know, and uh, uh, we support his uh, foreign policy. Uh, we think he uh, doesn't want bad things for Russia. So that's why we sure in our future, in future of our children, so, and we would like to have peace with everybody, you know, with America, and we remember good times, you know. I would like American people to find out the truth about uh, the Crimea, about our history. Even a little bit history, it will be very useful to understand why it was referendum, why it was Crimean Spring, and why we are so happy now to be in Russia. On the topic of war with the United States, most were not overly concerned and no one believed that nuclear war would occur. This retired Soviet and Russian Air Force colonel expressed the possibility of war with the United States, but stated that nuclear war is madness in a game that politicians play. Uh, even in military, uh, we, were, we, were tried, we were trained to be in readiness but we, in the USSR we have no any aggressions. So we stay in, in the first line um, in uh, Eastern Germany. So on the opposite uh, side of the border was uh, uh, NATO uh, troops. So we were in very um, good readiness, but the idea was to protect our motherland on the first line. We have no order to go, for example, to uh, English Channel. And, uh, so the idea was stand and protect our motherland. Do you think there's a danger 
a grave danger in Syria, that it could escalate into a war, and some people in America are talking about the possibility of a nuclear war. Do you think that is a possibility? <coughs> mm. I think this uh, possibility of nuclear war is uh, uh, complete madness, because uh, Nuclear war, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's will not, uh, not winner, not loser in that time. We all lose. It's uh, simply impossible. It's uh, uh, very difficult to use small nukes uh, uh, and stop at the, at that time. Uh, nuclear war, it's some, some kind of uh, uh, human insanity. As far as concern to Syria, um, of course, it's a um, very dangerous situation, and uh, um, but I know uh, from uh, my colleagues uh, in military uh, that uh, there are some kind of cooperation between military, and I think that uh, military professional can uh, find uh, um, uh, like like a professionals uh, can uh, find common language. It's only politicians who are doing the, um, some kind of uh, political games uh, which may try to, uh, uh, to find uh, uh, some, uh, some reason to do this, uh, I, I think, bad jobs. Uh, so, so it's not a military man mm -hmm. who are aggressive. It's a politicians. Well, Regis, you asked this question many times, and uh, the majority of Crimeans don't believe there will be a real nuclear war, because uh, everyone aware that there will be no winner in this game, and we remember the after effect and the results after Hiroshima, Nagasaki, even take Chernobyl or Fukushima. So we we all know the price which everyone will have to pay. So I don't think our political leaders are that naive to use the weapon, nuclear weapon, as a toy. In order to get a further objective and balanced view of just what President Putin represents, it requires nothing more than to compare his speeches with those of his counterparts in the U.S. and Europe, whom he calls partners and friends. Ну вот все-таки пришли к тому, что сейчас построили систему про в в Румынии. Говорили это все время о чем? Нам нужно защититься от иранской ядерной угрозы. Ссылаясь на, на якобы имеющуюся иранскую ядерную угрозу при строительстве системы ПРО. Ну так оно и есть на самом деле. В очередной раз пытались нас надуть. И обороны это часть наступательного стратегического потенциала. Но это, на мой взгляд, это большая опасность. Вот когда-то мы обсуждали, должны будем обеспечить безопасность не только свою. I lead the strongest military that the world has ever known. And I will never hesitate to protect my country or our allies unilaterally and by force where necessary. Consider Russia's annexation of Crimea and further aggression in eastern Ukraine. America has few economic interests in Ukraine. We recognize the deep and complex history between Russia and Ukraine, but we cannot stand by when the sovereignty and territorial integrity of a nation is flagrantly violated. If that happens without consequence in Ukraine, it could happen to any nation gathered here today. That's the basis of the sanctions that the United States and our partners impose on Russia. It's not a desire to return to a Cold War. So the United States is and remains the one indispensable nation. That has been true for the century past and it will be true for the century to come. That America's willingness to apply force around the world is the ultimate safeguard against chaos. And America's failure to act in the face of Syrian brutality or Russian provocations not only violates our conscience but invites escalating aggression in the future. America must always lead on the world stage. If we don't, no one else will. The United States will use military force unilaterally if necessary when our core interests demand it. Достаточно посмотреть на ситуацию на Ближнем Востоке и в Северной Африке, о чем говорил предыдущий выступающий на деле. 
агрессивное внешнее вмешательство привело к тому, что вместо реформ государственные институты, да и сам уклад жизни были просто бесцеремонно разрушены. Вместо торжества демократии и прогресса – насилие, нищета, социальная катастрофа. А права человека, включая и право на жизнь, ни во что не ставятся. Так и хочется спросить тех, кто создал такую ситуацию. Вы хоть понимаете теперь, чего вы натворили? Но, боюсь, этот вопрос повиснет в воздухе. Потому что от политики, в которой лежит самоуверенность, убежденность в своей исключительности и безнаказанность, так и не отказались. Что США представляют для нас угрозу. Вот президент Обама, как вы сказали, считает Россию угрозой. Я не думаю, что США для нас представляет угрозу. Я думаю, что политика правящих кругов, как, извините, употреблю такой штамп, политика правящих кругов, она является ошибочной. И уверен, что она противоречит и нашим интересам, подрывает доверие к Соединенным Штатам и в этом смысле наносит и Соединенным Штатам определенный ущерб. Подрывает к ним доверие как к одному из глобальных лидеров и в экономике, и в политике. Политики Соединенных Штатов. Мы считаем, что она ошибочно наносит ущерб всем, в том числе и вам. Что касается учета нашим относиться, это значит, что, ну, как я уже говорил в своем выступлении, нельзя дожимать, используя свои, свои э, исключительные э, положения в экономике там, или где-то в военной сфере. Понимаете, во всем. Ну хорошо, в Ираке там э, воюют плохо, в Ливии там все э, довели до того, что вашего посла убили в Ливии. А мы что ли это сделали? We came, we saw, he died. Приняли решение в свое время э, с этим безопасным лучшее решение. Ну ладно, а, а что на самом деле сделали? Начали сами наносить удары, в том числе и по территории. Явное, грубое нарушение резолюции Совета Безопасности ООН. Практически агрессия без всякой резолюции. Это мы что ли сделали? Это же вы сделали своими руками. А закончилось чем? Убийством вашего посла. Кто виноват? Сами виноваты. Вот это хорошо для США, что посла убили. Ужасно, страшная катастрофа. Но не нужно искать виноватых, если сами допускаете ошибки. Нужно наоборот подняться над, над вот этим желанием бесконечно доминировать и исходить из вот таких имперских амбиций. Не нужно отравлять сознание миллионов людей тем, что другой политики в Соединенных Штатах быть не может, кроме имперской. Instead, Is there nothing you will not lie about or justify? But in particular, what I find very strange was the statement by the U.S. representative who built her statement as if she was Mother Teresa. Now, please remember what country you're representing. Remember your own country's track record. And then, and then you can start opining from the position of any moral supremacy. So what Halford um, Mackinda said was with the advent of land-based mass transportation, namely rail, uh, that uh, the country that controlled the center of the global landmass, i.e. Eurasia, i.e. China and Russia, this country would become the most powerful country in the world because of its natural resources its natural advantages, its huge population, and that once this center landmass developed and consolidated itself and developed industry and transportation, this center of the economic mass would 
become the global power. And the United States has decided that it cannot allow China to continue to rise. Otherwise, the US dream of the US century, the 21st century as the US century, of this kind of unipolar global hegemon will be undermined. Oh, Fukushima, what have you done? The other threat to life on the planet is nuclear power. On March 11, 2011, a 9.0 earthquake in Japan caused a tsunami whose waves reached heights of 130 feet and crippled the Fukushima nuclear power plant, causing a nuclear meltdown which continues to spew radioactive material into the Pacific and the atmosphere. This is just the most recent reminder that nuclear power is not safe. This one nuclear accident alone spells death to the oceans and ocean life and eventually to all life on the planet. At the time, the nuclear power plant at Chernobyl in Ukraine, which exploded in 1986, was the worst in the history of civilian nuclear power. 31 deaths were directly attributed to the accident, all among the reactor staff and emergency workers. The total number of confirmed deaths from radiation was 64 as of 2008, but the eventual death toll could reach 400,000. But these accidents also have occurred and continue to happen here in the United States. The Three Mile Island accident was a partial nuclear meltdown that occurred on March 28, 1979 in Dauphin County, Pennsylvania. It was the most significant accident in the United States commercial nuclear power plant history. It was rated a five on the International Nuclear Event Scale. Fukushima and Chernobyl were rated a nine. The July 6, 2016 radioactive leak at New York's Indian Point nuclear power plant prompted renewed calls for the site to be shut down amid growing concerns about the potential damage a nuclear accident could do in one of the most densely populated parts of the country. Indian Point is located on the east bank of the Hudson River just 25 miles from midtown Manhattan. Even more alarming was the Associated Press investigation that found radioactive tritium had leaked from three quarters of U.S. commercial nuclear power plants, often into groundwater from corroded buried piping. Tritium has leaked from at least 48 of 65 sites, according to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So the dangers of nuclear power are long term not short term, and each reactor makes about 30 tonnes of very, very radioactive waste a year, containing up to 150 radioactive elements, some of which have never been investigated from a biological perspective. And this waste must be stored isolated from the ecosphere for a million years, according to the EPA. Um, and no container lasts longer than 100 years, be it concrete, steel, titanium, whatever, and they want to bury it deep in the earth but, you know, we're talking about geological time frames, a million years, ice ages, volcanoes, earthquakes, you name it. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, and anyway, the waste is definitely going to leak out. And of course, when you put it in rock, there are fissures in the rock and there's water in the fissures and the stuff will leak up up to the surface into water where, which is used to water plants and vegetables and animals. And what happens is these isotopes, be it strontium-90, which causes bone cancer and leukemia, or cesium-137, which causes brain cancer, muscle cancer, ovarian cancer, you name it, and many others, concentrate hundreds to thousands of times at each step of the food chain. So first it concentrates in the algae by orders of magnitude, then in the crustaceans that each eat the algae, then in the little fish, then the little big fish, and then us. And we stand at the apex of the pyramid of the food chain. So these elements concentrate most highly in us. And they last, some of them, for hundreds of years. And they deposit, like in the bone, and irradiate a very small number of cells. And one of those cells, or some of them, 
could have mutation in the regulatory gene that regulates the rate of cell division. And that cell, cell will sit latent and dormant for any time from five to 70 years. And one day, instead of dividing in a regular way by mitosis to produce two cells, it goes crazy and produces trillions of daughter cells, and that's a cancer. And we can't stop the growth of cancer usually, and those cells are very disruptive and can infiltrate into lymph vessels or blood vessels and go up to the brain and the lungs, and that's called metastases, secondary cancer spreading throughout the body. So cancer is really a parasite, and, and, and you can see a body just dissipating as the cancer grows, and then when the body dies, so does the cancer die. We can cure some childhood cancers, um, occasionally adult cancers, but on the whole, we can't cure cancer. So the dictum says, if you can't cure a disease, you not, must prevent it. And here we have an industry that's going to induce not just cancer for the rest of time, and animals and plants get cancer too, like us but random compulsory genetic engineering as it will mutate genes in the eggs and sperm in us and animals to induce mutations that will cause abnormalities like dwarfism, diabetes, cystic fibrosis, phenylketonuria. I can name many and there are 2,600 such genetic diseases. So it will produce a denigration of our genotype over the rest of time. So we're we're counterbalancing the positive aspects of evolution with negativity. That's if we survive. And that applies to animals and plants as well. Climate change is the third imminent threat to life on the planet. The main causes of climate change are agriculture, industry, a system based on fossil fuels, and consumerism. But often overlooked is war and militarism. For example, the United States military has the largest carbon footprint on the planet. Not even oil spills, offshore oil rig disasters, pipeline leaks, and oil train crashes, such as happened in Lac Megantic, Quebec in 2013, have changed the political discourse. At the current pace, we are consuming fossil fuels, destroying ecosystems to extract finite resources, clear-cutting forests, and poisoning our oceans, lakes, and rivers, Many now believe that life on Earth will no longer be sustainable by 2050. As sea levels rise because of melting ice on both poles, not only will islands in the Pacific disappear, but cities along both coasts will be affected. From Boston, New York City, Baltimore, and down the eastern seaboard to Miami, the Gulf of Mexico, and all the way up the west coast, large parts of our cities will be inundated. The same will happen on every continent. If current temperatures continue to rise as they are, life will become more and more difficult and even impossible for all of us. Bill, do you think we've gone beyond the point of no return? Look, it's too late to stop global warming. That's not one of the possibilities now. We've raised the temperature of the planet a degree, and the Arctic is melted. And even if we do everything right from this point on, probably we're going to see a temperature increase of at least two degrees Celsius globally. But if we do everything right, if we keep, if we get off gas and coal and oil right away, then we won't see the four or five degrees Celsius increases in temperature that would come otherwise, that what the scientists are predicting for our current path. There's a world of difference between two degrees and five degrees for this planet. One's miserable, but the other's probably impossible. So we have to fight like hell right now to keep it from turning into hell, more or less, at least a place with a similar temperature. The American way of life is a lie. It is based on glamour, consumption, and greed. But at its very roost, it is predator capitalism, where the wealthy elite are intent on abusing workers, violating human rights, and destroying the planet. They have corrupted every level of government and have used the military to impose their will. But instead of spreading freedom and democracy, America has spread death and destruction in countless countries around the world, including Japan, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Pakistan.
Since 1945, the United States military has killed more than 22 million innocent civilians. With the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a new era in human history began. It is an era when all of humanity, in fact, all life on Earth, can become extinct. It is encouraging that people around the world are waking up and rising up in small, and massive peaceful acts of civil disobedience. I, I think as the Occupy Wall Street movement illustrated, power no longer lies in Washington. Power lies on Wall Street, and power is global. So uh, you have corporate, global corporate forces uh, that have taken over whole governments, not just our government, but uh, governments throughout the world. Uh, India would be a good example, and uh, deform those governments to serve corporate profit at the expense of human lives and at the expense of the environment. Uh, and that's why this system is so pernicious. Uh, it, it, it's supranational. It, it's not bound by national borders at all. Uh, and, and what these corporate forces are doing in places like Bangladesh or uh, southern China, of course, exploiting workers, they're also doing here at home in the United States. Uh, they're reconfiguring uh, not only the American economy, but the global economy into a kind of neo-feudalism, a world of masters and serfs. Um, uh, and that makes, in many ways, these forces more difficult to fight. Uh, I think that we've seen with the Arab Spring, with uh, the protests in Greece, uh, the protests in Spain, uh, the Occupy movement, a kind of um, global reaction, uh, but it's a reaction not to a particular government, but in essence to forces of oppression that are uh, as intimately intertwined in the lives of Egyptians or Greeks as they are with Americans. Is that why you've said that uh, popular uprisings are the physical embodiment of hope? Yeah. They are. I mean, because those who are running the world today, the power elite today, uh, the fossil fuel industry will kill us. Are already. I mean, we already are seeing catastrophic changes within the ecosystem, and they are quite willing to sacrifice uh, the following generations for a short-term profit. They are doing it at this moment. So, either we radically reconfigure our relationship amongst each other and to the ecosystem. Uh, or, or we seriously talk about the extinction of the human species. And it may not be too far off, no, really. No, it's probably not too far off. Yeah. It's probably a lot closer than we think. We cannot trust the established systems of power. The, the established systems of power are driving us off a cliff. And unless we revolt, um, you know, we literally uh, have no future. Economic, uh, we have no economic future, but we also finally have no future as a species because these people are exploiting the ecosystem uh, while it's dying. I mean, 40% of the summer Arctic sea ice melts and there's a business opportunity for Shell, the death throes of the planet. Martin Luther King said in a church basement, uh, we've got the power in this room if we mobilize it to completely change the future course of America. Well, people could have said, this guy is insane. You know, <laughs> 40 people <laughs> who are nobodies uh, are going to change the future course of America, but uh, he believed that and had the faith that that could happen and inspired other people to, to believe that. And to, together they were able to bring about you know, really major change. And if we can realize we're not just a tiny minority, 
but the, we're, we're the massive majority of the world's people. And, and, and we have learned the power of nonviolence and non-cooperating with illegitimate authority as people of the world <laughs> have learned and are learning. Uh, we've got the power to create change. My hope in all of this is the prophecies of my elders, which tell us that there will be a global awakening. People from all corners of the world will rise up and will unite um, in order to heal the earth, in order to come back together as community, as kin, that we will start recognizing ourselves within one another. We will see the eyes of our children in the, ch in the eyes of other people's children. We will see our future in the guaranteed future of others. We will see our ability to continue to exist here in this beautiful place um, tied to our connection to the earth and our responsibility for preserving and protecting the earth. And that is happening around the world right now. I travel all over and I've met with people from all walks of life, from different corners of the world, and this awakening is happening. So the prophecies that the elders have been telling us about for generations are coming to fruition. Right now, things seem chaotic, they seem destructive, it seems like we're descending into darkness. But what I believe is that we are really in a birthing process. We are now in the long dark birth canal and there is new life emerging. And we are part of that birthing process. We're either locked into the deep dark birth canal, you know, terrified by the darkness, or we're standing beside the mother assisting the birth. And I think that it's critical for all of us to recognize that right now, all of the things that we're seeing come into the light um, are opportunities for us to heal. The things that are happening now in the world aren't new. They're on a larger scale, perhaps. And they're being illuminated because the sun is at high noon. And what this does is it brings everything that's been in the shadows into the light. And that's a really remarkable time. Uh, that gives us this really incredible opportunity to come together as a species for the first time, perhaps, in human history. The only real hope lies in the result of the epic battle for humanity's survival between two competing and contrasting worldviews. On one side is America's unipolar forced march for world capitalist domination with the use of the greatest military the world has ever known. On the other side is a view held by Russia, China, and the BRICS nations that is building a multipolar world based on respect the sovereignty of all nations, international law, the equal value of all peoples, and cooperation. Russia and China consider themselves as strong enough in their combined military and economic strength to withstand any acts of aggression. They will not accept the dictatorship of a unipolar world. So, here we are, humanity's epic battle for survival, an old geopolitical paradigm based on white colonial domination and empire versus the shared vision of others who are working for a peaceful world based on justice, international law, peace, and the respect, value, and prosperity of all people. The only question that matters is, will the neocons in Washington and their global elite masters, knowing they have lost this epic struggle, take the whole world down with them in a nuclear Armageddon. As Dr. Helen Caldicott said in the opening, this scenario is the only thing that matters now for all of humanity and all life on the planet. Are we an evolutionary aberrant designed in an evolutionary sense not to survive? I wonder. Thirty seconds to midnight That's what's left today After five billion years It's all we have And it's tick, tick, ticking away Thirty seconds to midnight And make no mistake It's getting closer every second With every bomb you make 
30 seconds to midnight with every drone attack. Doomsday clock is ticking away and it ain't winding back. Thirty seconds to midnight and we ain't got no time for perpetual war in Afghanistan, Yemen and Palestine. 30 seconds to midnight with a tactical nuclear bomb. Nuclear revitalization, but a nuke is one and done. 30 seconds to midnight in Somalia and Ukraine. Libya, Iraq, Syria, tech or war is the end of the game. Thirty seconds to midnight with every fossil fuel Bomb train, acid rain, chem trailer, play nothing for renewal Thirty seconds to midnight as the snow caps melt away North Pole, South Pole, gonna be a water hole with radioactive bouquet how many dead in the Congo for a cell phone will you pay? For tin and tungsten, gold and ten lumps, so you can sell for your way. Thirty seconds to midnight with every dredge and drill. Pellet incinerator clear, cut the trees, every gas and oil spill. Killing bees and butterflies with every GMO. Where you gonna get the food to eat when the pollinators go? 30 seconds to midnight with Hanford and TMI. Fukushima, Chernobyl, sacrifice zones, oh, we got to end the lie. Thirty seconds to midnight with DU weaponry, another minute closer to extinction with global warming and nuclear freeze. 30 seconds to midnight with Russian China where Who's gonna be left standing with Holocaust in the air? What will the world look like with nothing left alive? Mutations left among us if a Holocaust they survive Got just a short time to change the production line Wave solar and rail Instead of nuclear hail 30 seconds to midnight 30 seconds to midnight 30 seconds to midnight